Hello, everyone. I have Dr. Julie Holland here with me today. I have quite the introduction for her because she is an incredible woman with so much work under her belt. Um, she is a psychiatrist specializing in psychopharmacology with a private practice in New York. Um, and her knowledge behind the neurochemistry of the mystical experience is one of the reasons I'm having her on today. Um, you are so fascinating to me because you're such a mixture of hard science and mystical kind of experiences, which is kind of rare, right? The two don't always go hand in hand. So tell me a little bit about how that works, because from my understanding of you and your love of music and sort of, you know, there's so many parts of you that are very free and not to say that scientists and doctors are not free, um, but then you also have that very like incredible um, amount of education and studies and papers and books under your belt. We'll be talking about your books in a moment as well, but tell me about that sort of dichotomy in your life. Well, I see a guitar in your background too. <laughs> yeah, there's all music. Um, you know, I've, I've definitely found a tremendous uh, overlap between medicine and music and a lot of clinicians are musicians wow. and maybe that's not a coincidence. Um, but this sort of interface with science and art or, um, you know, rational materialism versus a sort of unknowable mystical, that's really, you know, where psychedelic research is. Like that's, that's right at the, you know, there's a lot of friction there um, yeah. and there's a lot of froth there right now. It's a very, it's a really heady time to be a, a psychiatrist and to be involved in psychedelic research right now. You know, it's, I've been, I was thinking about how the, um, the sort of, you know, green rush with cannabis, like it took place over a couple of decades, mm -hmm. but there is a real gold rush happening now with psychedelics and psychedelic research and, uh, you know, VC companies and people throwing money into, into these psychedelic companies that it, it's not going to happen over the decades that, that cannabis medicine yeah. did. It's really happening over a period of months or maybe years. It's very compressed and, you know, just like psychedelics <laughs> themselves, um, it's a very efficient way that, uh, you know, psychedelic assisted psychotherapy can, can transform behavior. Uh, it's like a technology for behavior change right. that psychiatry absolutely needs. Mm. Um, but what's interesting is, you know, even the way that it is presenting itself uh, into the business community is accelerated, is intensified, is uh, very efficient and effective. So it's, ju it's just like psychedelics themselves, you know, they're intense. Um, they're relatively short acting when you compare them to years of therapy. Right. Um, and the thing that's the thing that's driving it, just like the thing that was driving cannabis medicine, is efficacy. It works. Cannabis works. It's a great anti-inflammatory. It is good for pain. It's 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 an immune modulator. It affects your mood. You know, we know we have seen that pot and CBD is efficacious. And even more than that. I will tell you that MDMA assisted psychotherapy is efficacious, that psilocybin assisted psychotherapy is efficacious, that if you give people uh, a period of time of psychotherapy and then these long sessions with either MDMA or psilocybin or LSD or ayahuasca or ibogaine, there's all sorts of plant medicines and fungi that are efficacious, that work, that help people to break out of uh, learn patterns of behavior and develop healthier ways of being. Yeah. So the efficacy is going to drive, it's going to drive the industry. Um, right. You know, FDA, the FDA is really going to have to approve these medicines because they're going to be faced with, with incontrovertible data. Right. that these medicines really, really work and they work better than anything that we have in psychiatry so far. Right. So it's, it's a very exciting time to be a psychiatrist. I'm also, obviously it's a terrible time to be anyone with the pandemic. Um, there's a lot of business for people who are interested in therapy and healing and somatic work and trauma because we, we've got a lot of trauma now and yeah. you know, we've got about at least a year's worth of trauma that people are going to need to process. Um, and what's amazing and magical is that everybody is going through this together, you know, and usually everybody has their different story about how they were traumatized. And this is something totally unifying 
the entire world is being traumatized at once. Um, so, and I would even go so far as to say the city that you live in, New York City, um, I, or that you work in, in itself has, has sort of, there's a lot of people that I follow there that are saying like, the city's having to like redefine itself and they got hit the hardest the first. And so there's so much also because it's so, so dense. Um, and the life that one lives in New York City is so, it's so layered and complex as far as always being around people, not being at home a whole bunch. You know, I have friends that live there that didn't even know their roommate. They just came and went. And now here they are day in and day out looking right. at the person's face, right? So like, yes, the world, but also New York City is going to have a whole different sort of spectrum um, as it has in, in a lot of what I've heard you talk about and, and the effects of living in the city um, on people's mental health and things like that. So yeah, I think that there's this unification that is why we're doing this series because it's kind of like, what the fuck do we do post 2020? And it'll be an ongoing conversation. We're certainly not gonna find the answers here in each interview, but I find, I found you through Horizons, which I had never heard of until I really started to dive into the series and what I wanted to do and what it meant. And you were one of the only female doctors. Um, and it, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel as though from what I found that you, there's so many more men in the industry than women. You are, oh, yeah. yeah. Right? I mean, you are like, and, and, and so the, your approach then becomes so much more fascinating to me because you know, even like in Moody Bitches or your New York Times op-ed where you talked about women being over-medicated. I mean, that one, that was an incredible, incredible article. And if anybody's watching this, I encourage you to Google it. It's from 2015, but it is the most relevant still, especially during this yeah. time, right? Um, um, so that, that New York Times op-ed was called um, Medicating Women's Feelings. Yeah. And it was like the most emailed piece of the New York Times for an entire week. Uh, which was great for the for the rollout of Moody Bitches. I mean, it was written for the rollout of Moody Bitches. Yeah. Um, but it it really struck a nerve, and it was just this yeah. idea that women are over pathologized, and that and that uh, you know we just like men. Now keep this in mind. I mean, men for a long time have been traumatized. You know, don't cry. You're being a little girl. Man up. Nut up. All these things. You know, yeah. boys don't cry. But yeah. That we were getting those same messages too. And it was all a sort of like internalized misogyny, you know, don't be too emotional. Oh, I'm being hysterical. Um, and I don't want anybody to buy into that. The truth is really the men need to be more emotional. The men need to cry more. The men need to go to therapy. The men need to embrace their yin energy. Yes. Um, and women need to be more comfortable with their yang energy and, and how we sort of wield it. But to get back to your original point, yes, there are definitely more men than there are women in psychedelic research. Uh, there are a lot of white men, uh, but there are definitely women and women of color and minorities who are being called to like, please come join us. Like we know how pale male and stale this looks, but, but I also will tell you, you know, for every documentary you see when a white male you know, is, is sort of the face of psychedelic yeah. research, I will tell you that there are a lot of women sort of in the back room doing the work, you know, yeah. and, and the metaphor yeah. that I, I use that is like, I've been watching so many documentaries and I'm always like, where are the women? Where are the women? The last three the women are doing the work. Yeah. <laughs> the women are there. They're doing the work. It is just like if you interview a man after a meal and he's sitting back and smoking a cigar and drinking a brandy and the women who prepared the meal are now in the kitchen washing the dishes. Those are the women in the psychedelic space. We are here. Um, I belong to a great listserv of psychedelic women. It is international. There are tons of, of PhDs and MDs and LCSWs and all kinds of women with tons of letters after their names and a lot of education. They are in the field, they're doing the work, but they're not on the documentaries. Mm -hmm. They're just, they're not quoted in the news they're piece. producing the documentaries, you know, that's the other, it's, it's such a, yeah. a, a domino effect. And that's why I found it so interesting because of course, when I found you, then I started reading your book and I was, you know, really engulfing myself. And then of course, going to Netflix, which has this beautiful new array of things. And as I watched them with my partner, I just kept saying, even like the Britney Spears thing, the new one, I don't know if you just saw, it just came out. It, it's a New York Times documentary about just like the, and just the eye on her and the way she was treated because she was female and just like the mental health and how nobody talked about the mental health. And like when she shaved her head and all, it's very fascinating. It just came out, 
Um, but the whole time I just like kept hitting him and I was like, it's, if she was a man, yeah, I mean, it's like, it's like how much more time do we have? It's, <laughs> right. It sounds like we're saying it over and over, but, um, yeah, I was just watching something before we talked that you had an interview that you had done on a video about like the few days leading up to the period and how we express ourselves more and, um, and how that's healthy and how that may be how we really feel in the other parts of the month we're suppressing. And, and so I just, and it, you know, I've been reading good chemistry but then I'm also like as I read this and love this and have recommended it to so many I people. have one too oh my gosh <laughs> hey it's so wonderful it's just the reason I love this book is because of course I think you know I'm 35 almost 35 and so as as I guess a millennial you think like ooh psychedelics but also more science so like yeah let's look into it and I myself haven't had a lot of psychedelic experiences, but as you read it, and this is why I think in some ways other people have done your book a little bit of a disservice when they describe it. It's not really about psychedelics. It's really, and, and yes, it's in the title and I get it. And, and there's so much about that that's fascinating for sure. But what it's about is this idea of community, separation, the illusion of separation, isolation, um, and then of course the oxytocin, the, the thing that's talked about the most. and. And so I think I want to kind of dive into it. And I don't know if you're sick of talking about it because you talk about it in every single sense of the word. But I think for the sake of Spiritualized 2021 in this series and, and Hustle Craft, which is really created for creative hustlers to understand themselves better, to see themselves and other people, um, to understand that the science of connection, the bonding, the belonging, and the trust um, is built through oxytocin, oneness, um, as a community and, and hopefully with this new, um, this new leadership that we have, we can be one step closer to, you know, unifying the decisions that are already being made right now are electrifying for me. Um, you know, even the $15 minimum wage that they're, that they're literally discussing right now, um, yeah. will create a oneness for people to be able to even, you know, to even survive so that they may look at themselves differently, engage in their communities in different ways. So, um, let's dive a little bit more into oxytocin because it truly is sort of like the crux of your book that was released in June of last year. So yeah, 2020 heck of a year. <laughs> I, I had a book coming out about, about connection and cuddling and skin to skin contact and, you know, hugging and and put down your phone and close your laptop and go outside and be in nature and get naked and skin to skin and then and then COVID happened and I felt like oh my god everything I wrote about like nobody can take any of this advice right now right. basically but it turned out it turned out to still be pretty timely luckily yeah um nothing, nothing worse than spending a few years on a book and then they're like oh never mind <laughs> so um but you know I do talk about politics a bit and good chemistry and and sort of, for lack of a better word, I'm going to say socialism, but really it's like communalism. Mm -hmm. It's um, every making sure everybody has enough, making sure people are taken care of, um, not being so self-centered, you know, that if everybody gives to the middle, there's actually enough for everyone to share. And um, that, that really is sort of an oxytocin-based behavior. You know, the oxytocin is the thing that facilitates trust and bonding and sharing and giving and generosity um, and human touch helps to accelerate generosity. And so one of the things I was worried about with COVID is with everybody so isolated, um, would they become more selfish? And also, this is really important. When we are isolated, it, it really puts us in fight or flight. Mm -hmm. You know, it's bad for our bodies. Being, being chronically stressed is terrible for your body, right? But being chronically isolated is being chronically stressed. So right. all of us, you know, for months and months have had to adjust to something that physiologically is, is a huge stressor, mm -hmm. um, which is why, in case you're wondering why you don't sleep very well, uh, you're gaining weight, um, and you can't think very clearly, it's because you're sort of chronically in fight or flight. And cortisol makes you fat and makes it, you know, adrenaline makes it hard to sleep. And being in fight or flight is terrible for your immune system. Um, and we're all kind of like a little bit chronically inflamed, sort of, which causes insomnia, causes obesity, uh, causes anxiety, depression, you know, all the things that we're feeling 
part of the reason why we're feeling so crappy and our brains just aren't working like they should is because of the isolation. Yeah. And then there's also the fear of contagion, right? It's putting right. us in fight or flight. Absolutely. And good chemistry is all about finding ways to get out of fight or flight. Yeah. I mean, it has its benefits. You know, if you're being chased by a tiger or whatever, it's right. great that you have all the adrenaline and cortisol. <laughs> but um, it's no way to live. Um, it's no, it is no way to live. And unfortunately, it's still how a lot of us are really living now. And I think that the Trump era also put us in fight or flight. A lot of us were really scared uh we felt bad about the the you know bad is such a time you know we felt terrible about the inequality yeah. um and you know what was going on with immigrants yeah. or, or poor people yeah. or everybody who was marginalized yes. there was just you know it was not a good feeling era uh it was a great time to be a psychiatrist again like business was good yeah people especially in new york city were very miserable and really afraid afraid for the fall of democracy and we yeah. saw how close we really came. Yeah. Um, so what I like now, um, now that Biden is in office, now that there are vaccines available, is that we can very slowly kind of defervesce and take it down from DEFCON 5. And, you know, maybe we can sleep a little better. Maybe we can think a little clearer because we're not completely freaked out and panicked that we are going to die. Yeah. Um, I mean or that things are just going to devolve into chaos even with how close it was. I mean, I remember going to sleep the night before and I just was hysterical. And I just thought, I mean, I can't believe this. And even now I still think I don't even fully believe that, you know, I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's an incredible time. And one thing that we talked about when we talked on the phone, I have it here somewhere is the childhood trauma of the U S and Yes. I find that to be something that we could have probably a whole series on, right? And and unearthing and debriefing about the way that we've treated others. And I think I can connect that to, A, if you and I as white women of privilege have felt that along with so many of our peers and others, we can only begin to imagine, I don't even think we can imagine the way that others in this country have been treated and felt for decades, not just during the Trump era. And that the Trump era was just like the, you know, lifting the lid of the, you know, truth that's existed for so long. Um, and I've, I've said it to friends before I heard you say it, which is just that like, we're like this embarrassing baby, you know, France is so old and Italy's been around for so long and all these countries have had their time to kind of fall and make mistakes and basically be idiots and assholes. Um, and so it's kind of like, we're the baby the powerful baby somehow. Yeah, it's like we went through our adolescence. You know, I mean, one one good thing you can say about Trump is that he really brought a lot of things to the to the surface. You think about like if the body has an abscess and yeah. you have like aches and pains, but you don't know why. But once it finally comes up to the surface and it's red and the pus starts to come out, you're like, oh, there's a problem down there. <laughs> there's an abscess. And so, you know, Trump was like the pus that yeah. got us to really look at the deep wounding um, that's the way I like to think about him. So yeah. the deep wounding is that the country we all know was founded on, you know, the genocide of the native peoples yeah. and then slavery. So like, you know, uh, pardon my French, but like we fucked over a lot of people to create America more than once, you know, and, and many different populations were completely uh, annihilated and, and taken advantage of in horrible ways so that we could be where we are now. Yeah. Um, you know, I feel sort of, ob I know this is cliche, but like I'm, I'm sitting on a uh, land that was stolen from the Lenape people. That's, that's, you know, the New York sort of indigenous population. And it's reasonable to acknowledge them um, and to acknowledge my privilege. But so because, because the United States has this sort of childhood trauma, you know, this repressed, nobody wants to talk about how we fucked over the native people or, you know, how we, you know, we're terrible, like we took people out of their homes in Africa, brought them here, put them in chains, you know, millions died on the way over. They it just like, we just sort of sweep that under the rug and pretend it didn't happen. And it is very much as if, as if a patient has been physically abused, sexually abused, repress that and doesn't understand why they're being so chaotic and acting out. And it's because, oh, you have this childhood trauma you need to process. So how does a nation yes. unearth and and process this deep childhood wounding yes i don't know we don't know but that's what we I don't know but we can i think this year can, can thank the donald <laughs> thank thank the donald for the pus that he brought to the process 
um, so that we can focus on the wound. Yeah, and I think that it, I mean, going back to your book, I think, you know, what is the answer? We don't know. It's, 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 it's obviously a process that we're all going to have to figure out together. But I think it starts with community and it starts with connection and it starts with bringing that oxytocin. I've seen more mutual aid in the last three weeks on social media and come here and eat this and anyone come all come on. And I mean, I've seen it more even in the last you know few weeks. I don't know if my my soul and my eyes are more open to it, or I'm just engaging more with people that are have been doing this for a long time. Because I never certainly never want to sit here and say like it's happening now when it's been of course happening for so long. But I feel as though there is this sense of community and love and appreciation for even little moments like my best friend's son's 12th birthday this weekend, where everyone was roller. I'm in San Diego, so we can be outside right now. Uh, everyone was roller skating and there was just this feeling of like oh my god we're rolling and it's like we're going back to the basics and by no means do I think that's going to fix the immense amount of pain and history and suffering that we need to face head on but at the same time so much of the things from your book this this idea that if we can find a way to connect to nature to ourselves to spend time with natural materials and to kind of peel away the layers of you know the addiction to the phone and the lack of sex happening as a result and step back into making love and um just so many other you know things within our own homes if we have the opportunity because we're not living alone which i feel grateful for every day um, that that can be the source. And don't you think that last year so much was stripped away from us that today we're sort of like lucky. And I hate saying that because I know so many lives were lost, but I feel lucky that there is this sort of simplicity that we only now have the chance to revisit that we never had before. Yeah. Well, one thing is, you know, you don't appreciate what you have until it's gone. Right. right. And so, you know, remember like being in concerts or being in bars and, you know, being in subways is like just, you know, the humanity packed closely, yeah. um, you know, I miss that and I, and I miss hugging. Yeah. Um, but I do, you know, I, I actually, I don't live in New York City. I live in a very small town about an hour and 20 minutes north of the city. But like when you, when you leave New York City and when you drive north, you go back in time, the further away from the city you go. And um, I live in a very, in a really small town that's like co super community oriented, very, very churchy, and very sort of blue collar. Um, and I, I was really struck by uh, how much sharing was going on. I have, I have a friend who runs the resource center and she's like, you know, we've never had so many donations. Like we have, we have more food and more money to give to people than we've ever had. So there was really this outpouring and people, I even noticed like with the Super Bowl commercials, how many of them were focusing on, on connection and community and oneness and unity and togetherness, um, great messages you know, tied into my book. I was like very happy to see, you know, that's, that's part of my brand. So yeah. I, I like that we are re returning to, uh, we're turning toward each other and, and really appreciating how terrible it is to be isolated. Yes. I know. I know that you had said at one point you had a client that hadn't been hugged in like, it was like a number of months, like maybe eight and I just, yeah. oh my gosh, I, I feel like I would be one that would want to like set something up where people can come and get hugs if they need them, because it's just so important to the way that people connect and just to feel that feeling. And again, you don't realize it until it's gone, right? Well, there were, there are professional cuddlers in New York City. I don't know what they're doing now during the pandemic, but, but a couple of years ago, I had, I had learned that there were people who offer their services, you know, the being held, um, the, uh, it, just like when you're a baby and you are held, you know, it helps to get you out of fight or flight and over into the parasympathetic. Mm -hmm. It helps to uh, increase the amount of oxytocin that is in your body and in the holder's body. But yeah. you can hold people, you know, figuratively or literally. Um, and one of the things I talk about in good chemistry is that if you are alone, you can actually do something called havening, where you you give your your body the illusion that it is being held and petted and attended to and to help you feel safe. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I have patients who live alone who, you know, would like to date. I have, I have a woman who would like to get pregnant and she's like, I don't know, can they do like mail order sperm? You know, it's like, it's, it's a very tricky time to, yeah. to pair off if you're not already paired. Um, it's hard for people who, uh, 
uh, maybe are also who are with the same people day in and day out, right? You know, when we're with our families or we're in a dyad and, and there's nowhere to go but back to that person over and over, um, that can also be incredibly challenging, you yeah. know? Uh, I, a lot I, of us are sort of having a mirror being held up to our face more than usual, you absolutely. know? Absolutely. My partner said when this all started, he said, I bet the divorce lawyers are sharpening their pencils. And I thought, yeah, the two people who are probably you know, business-wise benefiting the most aside from like an Amazon would be therapists and divorce lawyers. It's been, it's been yeah. incredible and sad to see how many of even my close friends have separated during this time. Really? Because I mean, my, my experience is that I feel like mostly like people are attending to their own, uh, they're, they're taking some time to make sure that their relationships are in better shape. And they're tending to their dyads or they're tending to their families. And I think for, for some of us, you know, we like that, like, like my daughter came home from college for a while. And so the four of us, you know, we're like this nuclear family, like we used to be when the kids were small. Um, it was a really magical, special time last spring, you know, and it was a time for us to, that we never would have had. The four of us never would have had so many days and weeks just together to do stuff and we played music and we you know we made recordings and like just we did stuff we never would have we'd like did paint by numbers yeah. uh, you know molly and i like took a tap dancing class online like just weird shit that we yeah. never would have done but because yeah. it was day after day of what are we going to do today and you can only bake so much bread and you know watch so many tiger king <laughs> episodes in the beginning but that seems like like a lifetime ago now it right? literally, literally was almost a year ago it's so crazy yeah yeah, absolutely. And I agree. And, and there's this like weird thing where I always want to acknowledge the amount of pain and suffering. But I also, you know, before I say just what an incredible time it was for my family as well. I have a four year old son and my partner, Jason. And, you know, there was a lot of breaking down and rebuilding our relationship because we had such a like busy working, you know, come home to make a quick dinner, go, you know, we were busy and, and I'm happy to not be busy. It felt like this huge relief had, had been lifted. And, and I didn't care if we yeah. were eating ramen every night, if I wasn't working because we were just relaxed and it was so nice to just feel peace for the first time in a long time, because our, you know, our culture is just so go, go, go. And it just feels so, so different now and that we can, there will never be going back to normal, right? Because we've learned so much about ourselves and our need for connection and our need to, to go within. And that's what this is all about. One thing I wanted to ask yeah. you that I haven't heard a lot of people ask you is why, what is it? And I actually wrote this down and I want to make sure I say it. Your interest in the way that drugs affect behavior is really what got you into the field. Why do you think you are so interested in the altered states of consciousness in humans? Because I know your trajectory of like, you went to school, you studied this, you studied and you figured this out. Like yeah. I know that history, but like what happened in your life? Have you analyzed it for yourself? Why? Oh, sure. I've definitely analyzed it. Um, <laughs> But it goes, it goes pretty far back. Like, um, you know, my mom tells me that like when I was teething, they would give me laudanum, which is in the opiate family. And my mom was like, you really like that laudanum. <laughs> like, you know, what's not, what's not to like? I mean, um, I was held as a baby. I was nursed. Um, uh, but I grew, I was born in 65. I grew up in the seventies. There were a lot of drugs around. It was the end of the sixties, seventies. There, there was, there were just drugs readily available. I grew up watching people get drunk, get stoned. Um, you know, later when I was in high school, I saw people, uh, you know, snorting coke quite a bit or taking acid. And I was just completely intrigued by the idea. I mean, especially with acid, you know, it's a tiny little piece of paper, yeah. you put it on your tongue and then you have committed to something for 12, maybe 15 hours. You don't know where it's going to go. Like, I just, it was amazing to me that something that tiny could just flip your entire worldview around. So I was a, a very inquisitive kid, um, really interested in, in the brain and the body and diseases. And I remember like even, you know, in fifth or sixth grade doing reports on like diabetes or multiple sclerosis. Like I was just really interested in the brain and the body, but, uh, especially interested in drugs and, and did quite a bit of, you know, bioassays where I would, I wanted to know what does this feel like? How does this work? Um, and, you know, I was, I was a kid who experimented with drugs, but I took notes, <laughs> you know, I was like yeah. a researcher. I was really curious about it. And so, and then I went to college specifically to study uh, the intersection sort of of psychology and biology to, um, 
my major at, at Penn was called the biological basis of behavior. And it was really looking at, at like neuropsych and, and neurobio and psychopharm. So, um, and I took like almost every, every class in that major. I spent almost every summer at Penn. Um, I was just so into it. And um, when I first learned about MDMA, I was, I was like, a, uh, it was one of my summers at Penn and like there was a new drug and I was, thrilled to find out there was a new drug because up until then there was like five or six like there right. weren't new drugs right. like you know now there's new drugs all the time you can now you can barely keep up to 2ct7 and 2cb and you know 2cti and like it's all this alphabet soup but back then back when i was a kid we had a new drug and it was mdma and it was like oh and also not only was it a new drug which was enough to get me very excited but right. it was a drug that was being used by therapists during therapy to make the therapy uh, go faster and go deeper. And I, here I was uh, a pre-med planning on being a psychiatrist. So I was like, you know, jackpot. Yeah, totally. So, you know, for, and actually that, you know, from that summer, I met people, uh, I spent a lot of time on the phone. I had, I had access to free long distance, which back then, no, but you know, wow. you didn't, you had to pay for like every minute that you were on yeah. the phone. Yeah. Um, but I, but that was when I first got to, got to know Rick Doblin and Lester Grinspoon and George Greer. I just spent time on the phone with, with anybody who was doing research on MDMA. And so when I ended up um, putting this book together on MDMA, I just sort of assigned a chapter to all these different specialists. So it was pretty easy for me to, to amass um, a lot of uh, sort of uh, cutting edge information about a brand new drug. Um, but I'm, I'm still extremely interested in MDMA assisted therapy. I've spent the last 25, 30 years now um, uh, being, being the medical monitor for the MDMA assisted psychotherapy research. And now I'm not a medical monitor anymore, which I love because it was getting to be more and more work as, as MAPS was getting bigger and they would like these multi-center phase three trials. So now I'm just like a medical advisor. Well, which basically cool. means like if we have complicated questions, we'll ask you. So yeah. I like look, Congratulations a little bit on less the amount of work you did to get there. <laughs> I mean, it's incredible how much time you've spent. And also from what I've also read and, and seen from, from your work that we're closer than ever, like you said in the beginning of this conversation and that they're moving these along and that the results from the MDMA tests are just like, ready for public consumption in the medical world. Is that correct? Am I saying that properly? Yeah. So the fate, there's like phase, when you, to get FDA approved, you have to do phase one, two, and three. And, and we are in the middle of the phase three trials. And they looked at the first half of the data from the multi-center phase three trials. And they saw that the first half of the data is very clean and very strong. And they, they've got robust findings um, where there's very, very small chance that these findings are a coincidence. Right. So, um, so the data is very, very clean and strong and convincing. Um, and the second, we just have to gather the second half. Basically. Right. Um, and so does it go, it goes beyond, because a lot of what I've read, the work that you've done was for PTSD for war veterans. Is that correct? Yeah. So some of the, some of the earliest MDMA studies were, victims of sexual trauma. And then it was opened up to, um, to uh, people who had PTSD from being in, in wars, basically, so veterans. Um, but also we were seeing firefighters, uh, police officers, just people who had been exposed to tremendous trauma um, where they felt like their lives were threatened. That the most the newest research that's just starting to get off the ground that we're going to be doing is looking at frontline healthcare workers um, who really have been traumatized by by COVID and the pandemic and everything they've seen. You know, most doctors uh, they don't deal with death as often as you know you might think on the TV shows, and when it happens, it hits you really hard. And I mean, I still remember. You know, it's it's not even on one hand, but I mean, those things you carry them. And you know these nurses and doctors are dealing with a, a lot of people dying, and just oh, it's a lot to process. And it and it it is still. I was going to say it went on for a long time, but it's still going on. Yeah. So um, 
the we're going to be recruiting um, healthcare workers if they would like to go through a placebo controlled trial uh, for MDMA assisted psychotherapy to see if it will help them with some of their symptoms um, of of post traumatic stress disorder. And it's incredible too because um, in one interview I heard you talking also just about the psychology of a doctor and the fact that you know there is this sort of you know, rise in their intelligence that is beyond a lot of other humans on this, you know, in this for professional, you know, reasons that yeah. they've been told yes and great job and you know better than anyone. So their personality type um, isn't used to this often rejection that that death sort of also feels like they didn't do enough. And so just dealing with that. So Definitely. I find it interesting that um, there's that. And then the psychology of a police is completely different. And the psychology of a uh, someone who served our country and been in war is completely different and so it's so interesting that that this one drug is serving these people who have gone through these traumas and of course you know like even if you just took sexual trauma everyone's sexual trauma is completely different you would never treat it the same but what i find so interesting right. is that each of these frontline workers um the psychology and not to put them all in a box but this i would imagine the psychology of if you had to put it in a box of a doctor and the way that they went through school and the way that they were sort of groomed versus you know the psychology of like you know a good old boy you know police officer and, and that kind of like man right. you know even though females are involved um they're all so different so to, so the fact that our country or this world or people like yourself have found that this one drug has sort of helped and assisted rapidly the experience of trauma with these people who have very diverse traumas, but all also come from totally different approaches to their jobs. To me, there's like nothing more fascinating. It's it's incredible. Yeah. And obviously, it's fascinating to you because I still see that like sparkle in your eye when you talk about it, which is so yes. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I mean, one of the one of the things I say frequently about MDMA is I couldn't design a better drug. Yeah. to to be a catalyst to make psychotherapy go deeper and go faster and be more effective like it's just checks all the boxes um the most unique thing about mdma is that it markedly increases oxytocin so that sense of trust and openness and wanting to connect and feeling bonded and safe and held and cared for you've got all of that um, it also massively increases serotonin. It's a, it basically floods the synapse with serotonin. So, and serotonin is all about uh, satiety, feeling like you have enough. And, and, you know, the, I mean, if you think about sort of PMS where you're like, you want something, but you don't quite know what you want and you're kind of angsty and you're kind of uncomfortable, but you don't know necessarily what would make you feel better. So, you eat chocolate or you try this, but nothing quite works. But so the opposite of that would be a very high serotonin state where you feel super comfortable and like you don't need anything and not very anxious and not very sad. So that's all the serotonin. But then you also have it's a, a really uh, a pretty potent dopamine agonist, which means you also have, you know, keep in mind uh, MDMA, it's the MD is methylene dioxy, but then the other MA is methamphetamine. So it's kind of like a cousin to speed. So you still have that, the stimulating effect, you know, your pupils get big, you're very focused as if you've taken an ADD medicine, mm -hmm. uh, you don't get distracted, you've got a task at hand, you know, you're trying to work through the trauma, you're motivated and really attending to that, you have the intention of that, that's all from the dopamine. You know, you're awake, you're alert, you wanna talk, you want to process, you want to dig, you, you've got the motivation and the attention and the intention. So it's this combination of oxytocin, dopamine, serotonin that, uh, you know, a great trifecta, it, it just, it creates, um, it, it puts the brain in a very plastic place. So not only can you access your trauma, but you can work with it and restructure it a little bit and add a little bit more of a narrative. You know, every time we remember something, I think people have this idea that you, you know, memory is like you pull out a file, you read it, you put the file back. But it's really not like that. You pull out the file, you read it, you you overwrite a few things and then you put it back. Yeah. And with MDMA, you can do a lot more overwriting. You really you have access to the you really have full access to recalling the trauma. You're brave enough to talk about it. You're relaxed enough to talk about it. You trust the therapist enough to open up to talk about it. But be, there's this neuroplasticity that happens with oxytocin, which means that you can rework 
the trauma a little bit. You can add a little bit of a narrative. Right. Um, and so you can you can weave in a little bit of, uh, I, I did the best I could. I couldn't have fought any harder than I did. It wasn't my fault. It doesn't matter what I was wearing. Um, or even, even having some empathy for the perpetrator. Um, which, you know, I know it's hard for people to wrap their head around, yeah. but, but you, there's just a, a, a sort of a heart opening, more accepting for the fact that the trauma happened. You know, we spend so much energy rejecting our history, rejecting reality. You know, this shouldn't be, that shouldn't have happened. I don't like the way you're acting. You should be a different way. It's like, you know, if we could just accept yeah. this is what happened this is reality, we would already feel so much better. And so there's a tremendous level of acceptance that happens with MDMA, um, acceptance for the fact that the trauma happened. And then and, also I feel like the aftermath too, because once you accept, then you really feel, and when you're in that state, then you can sort of like play with and work with, not to play with, but you know what I mean, uh, where the doctor can help control sort of like the, the mending of after the acceptance. I right. And it, it's this integration that you integrate it into your whole story, you know, instead of something walled off, right. it's, you know, it's a part of the snowball and you yeah. integrate it and you accept that it, it's also what, you know, what made you strong and it's what made you who you are. Um, and it, what, it's what makes you compassionate to other people who've been traumatized and, you know, that there are some good things that can come out of it. Absolutely. And you just have a level of acceptance and integration that before it was rejecting and repressing and walling off and that's a lot of psychic energy to keep that stuff yes. out of, you know, out of sight, out of mind. And yeah. it's, you know, one of the, one of the metaphors I give speaking of out of sight of out of mind, you know, I feel like for people who have been traumatized when they take antidepressants or anti-anxiety meds or sleeping pills day in and day out, it, it's like sweeping dirt under the carpet. You're not really dealing with, What's caught, you know, why are you sad? Why are you anxious? Why can't you sleep? And sometimes it is purely chemical, but lots of times it's not. And the way we work in psychiatry now, um, and it's easier, is that we just give pills for symptoms. So, oh, you're anxious? Here's a pill so you won't be anxious. Yeah. But in the old days, it was, why are you anxious? What happened when you were three years old that's making you anxious? Let's work through this, you know. It's just, it's quicker to give a pill. But now we can, you can sort of do both. You can give something pharmacologically, but you're not sweeping dirt under the carpet. You're taking the carpet out back yeah. and beating the hell out of it. You're vacuuming the floor. Then you're putting the carpet down. Yeah. You may not need meds after that. Yeah. You know, you don't, you've done, you've done something much more structural and deep and much less superficial. You know, you're not throwing a bandaid on it. Yeah. You're, you're like excising that abscess. You know, yep. you're not just wiping away the pus every day. You're actually getting down there and getting this malignant thing that needs to come out. You're, you're, it, you're pulling it out and you're examining it and, and you're acknowledging yeah. that it's been there and what it's done and how it's holding you back. And if you can just set this malignant thing aside, you can move forward. Absolutely. Well, we closed with the pus today. <laughs> <laughs> That's the theme, the theme of today. Um, you are, incredible. you know, any, I have to tell you, they're all, they're all uh, signs and symptoms to be interpreted, you know, yeah. any, any kind of complaint. It's like a fever, you know, why do you have a fever? Yes. Don't just take tyl Tylenol to make the fever go away. You have to figure out what the fever is. It's well, and I think with depression, and anxiety, generational thing that happens. And I won't speak about my own family. Um, but it's interesting too, because I think my generation either 50% of my friends take pills to cope and 50% are like me. And there's no judgment to people who take pills, but I will do anything and everything to work through the inside of myself, my brain, my trauma, my childhood to not have to take a pill. But if I need to, I'm okay with that. And there's no judgment, but, um, it's so interesting. The friends that just took the pills are just still on the pills and always confused as to why things are wrong, always. And it's like, yeah. it just feels like years of difference for those who, I don't want to sound judgmental, so I won't, I won't say that, but you know, the well, world. I will, I will say a couple of quick things about daily dose because, um, you know, it's, it's tricky because I have a lot of negative things to say about psychiatry and how we just, you know, 
band-aid over symptoms. Um, but keep in mind, this is what I do for a living. I'm a psychiatrist and I prescribe medicines for people. But yeah. But I do two things. One is it's very possible that if you're on antidepressants for 10 years or 20 years, um, it's going to be very hard to come off of them and you're always going to feel worse off than you do on. Um, and that makes me very nervous. You know, there's something called tardive dysphoria, which is this theory that the longer you're on antidepressants, the worse you actually feel and the more you, you need them. Yeah. And if you think there's a lot of other medicines that work that way, right? Yeah. Uh, pain meds, the longer you're on them, the more you need. And the worse you feel when you come off of them. Yes. That's one thing. And then the other thing that really makes me nervous is that we looked at uh, a bunch of people who had had MDMA um, in a research setting. And we divided those people into the ones who had had SSRIs before and had antidepressants before, and then the people who'd never had it. And the people who had never had any antidepressants before had a much more robust response mm -hmm. to the MDMA assisted psychotherapy. Their numbers went down more, they got better, much, much more than the people who had been on antidepressants. Yeah. So I'm hoping that maybe they just weren't off them long enough. But what I'm afraid of is that it may be that if you're on antidepressants for decades, you may not respond as well to MDMA assisted psychotherapy. And yeah. that will really be a shame if that is the case. Yes. And I'll be interested to see once, you know, you finish this third phase and the FDA approves and we start moving this along to become, I don't even know what it's going to look like. And I'm sure you have a much better clue, but um, how much more, because one thing I found so fascinating about your work was that both people who were taking, uh, actually, this was when you were talking about CBD, um, Adderall and Ritalin and things to focus and then SSRIs and things for anti-depression, which are completely different that the CBD had both helped with both. And so I, I really hope for, you know, a place where, because I have seen the way that these drugs, and again, I respect, you know, what you do and, and the way that they work for a lot of people, but I've also seen the way that they deeply on a long-term basis affect people. And the hope is that, you know, a lot of our spiritual healing as we sort of like wrap up this conversation can be found in the future of medicine and what people like yourself are finding and the work that you're doing. And I can't tell you, and I don't know if a lot of people do, and I hope that you hear it often, that you are an incredible human being and the work that you've done and the books that you've written, which we didn't even talk about all of them, but the pop book, Ecstasy, the New York Times bestselling Moody Bitches, um, and of course the most recent Good Chemistry are an absolute privilege for people to be able to read because they clue us into parts of ourselves that you've spent your whole life um, dedicated to understanding. And I'm just so, so, so grateful for your mind, your knowledge, your love, um, and of course your words. So thank you. I'm full of love. It's true. Um, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Um, great. It was nice to speak to you. You too. I hope you have a beautiful day and thank you for everything that you said on this interview. We will be launching this live um, on March 7th. Great. Alrighty. Have a beautiful Thanks a lot. day. Thanks. All right. You too. Bye. Bye-bye.